So we're here today uh, to talk about tips and tricks for final impressions. And the first thing I want to do is I want to just kind of put out there the objectives uh, for our presentation today. Uh, we have four very important objectives in this presentation today, and I want to start just reading out the first one. It, it, we're going to talk about the importance of tissue health in regards to uh, impressions. Uh, we're going to try to make everybody understand when to use digital uh, versus analog. Is there still room for analog? Is it that we ha have to do everything digital today? Where are we at, or at least where am I at with this, with the digital versus analog world? Uh, the importance of margin location in our uh, preparations for ideal impressions. And finally, the importance of margin elevation techniques uh, that are required sometimes in order for us to be able to achieve ideal impressions. The other thing that I want to uh, remind everybody is to please follow us on our webpage, www.romerodentalseminars.com. Uh, don't forget that all our tips and tricks webinars are recorded and then, and then they are edited and we upload them in our, uh, onto our webpage. So you will find an on-demand button where you can uh, make sure that you, if you, if you want to review something or if you want to share these videos with other uh, dentists or colleagues, please uh, just go ahead and do it. They're free. So uh, there's no cost on, on, on getting into this platform. And in that same link of webinars, you will find our upcoming um, webinars, you know, different topics so that you can sign up and register for them early because there's, uh, there's always limited seating in every webinar. All right, so let's get started with our tip and trick number one. So the first thing that we're going to talk about today in the morning is about tissue health. And uh, this for me is very important because I know as a general dentist, and I know that many of you do general dentistry out there, uh, are, are confronted with exactly the same issues that I'm confronted with when I see my patients. And I want to share with you this first case because, uh, again, this is something that I see very frequently. So this patient comes to me, and you can see on tooth number seven, uh, she's got a crown, an all ceramic crown. Uh, but I want you to, I don't want, let's not look at the crown. I want you to take a look at the tissue around the crown. And when we observe a little bit closer, you can see the inflammation present uh, around the tissue. And, uh, and when you look at the x-ray, you can see the reason why uh, there is inflammation. Uh, most, you know, the, the most important thing is that the tissue is a little bit deep, but you can see that uh, on the x-ray that the tissue is not violating biological width. But what do you, you do see is that open margin where now you're going to have a bacteria trap and, and that accumulation of bacteria around that area is going to create this inflammation. Now, this patient, you can see that she's, you know, she's got a fairly thick biotype. She's got very nice and square teeth, a very thick biotype. But, you know, regardless of the biotype, if you have a place where bacteria can grow easily, you will get this type of reaction. Now, uh, once we removed the crown, and this is the same day that we went ahead and removed the crown because now we knew that we had, it, we had to uh, redo that restoration. But I want you to focus now on uh, interproximal margins. And obviously, at this point, there's inflammation, so there's growth of the tissue. But I want you to look at the depth of the margin because, you know, the margins were fairly deep, mainly interproximally. You're looking there, they're a little bit, you know, almost um, two millimeters deep from the papilla all the way down to the distal and mesial margin. And those margins being that deep, uh, you know, they, if you have open margins, it's impossible for the patient to, uh, to clean that area. But most importantly, what most, most likely happened in this particular case was that when they prepped the tooth, having those uh, mesial and distal margins so deep, it was very hard for the dentist to obtain a good impression or a scan of that area and then get an ideal uh, fitting restoration. So that's really the problem with, uh, with uh, uh, incorrect management of the soft tissue uh, around our margins, is that it really makes it very difficult and complex for us to get a good impression. So it is crucial that we consider this and that we open our eyes and, uh, and make sure that we understand that if for whatever reason there is uh, um, deep margins in previous restorations that are already causing inflammation, there's gonna have to be other measures that we're gonna need to take most likely refer the patient to a periodontist so that we can uh, correct the issue and then you know, relocate the margins to an area where they're accessible to us and they're accessible to the patient as well to maintain a clean uh, uh, area. So you can see the same day we went ahead and removed the crown, we fabricated a temporary, and now we made sure that this temporary was sealed around the margins of the tooth. 
Now, that being said, because there was a lot of inflammation, we want to make sure that we follow up this case. And uh, up to this point, uh, I was waiting to see how much of the tissue can, uh, you know, can, can heal, if you want to call it that way, just by removing the previous restoration, removing the causing factor, sealing the margins with a temporary and just letting the tissue do what it needs to do. So this is uh, three months after the crown removal. You can see my temporary is still in place. And you know, when, I, when I'm confronted with these cases, uh, and obviously because of uh, the patient's uh, job responsibilities as well, uh, it, you know, it wasn't that easy for me to just get her back into the chair. And, and, uh, and I really wanted to make a good assessment of this. So I waited, I let the tissue do the best it can. I was following up on the patient. You can see that the tissue looks a lot better just by, you know, just by closing the, uh, the space or the gap between the, the crown margins and the, and the actual preparation margins. But, you know, you really have to go in with the probe and make sure because, again, what would be my next step? My next logical step would be remove the temporary, place a cord, and get a new impression or a new scan. But if you look at this, you can see what the response of the tissue is three months later. You can see that the, this is actually a photo taken by the periodontist. I had referred the patient to the periodontist at this point for an evaluation. And you can see uh, how uh, you know, the tissue was still bleeding. Now, why is this important? Because if we, were to, if we were not to send this patient to the periodontist, if we were not to consider any other type of procedures uh, in order for me to be able to uh, fabricate a new restoration for this patient, I would need to place a cord and I would need to control that bleeding well in order for me to be able to obtain a good impression. And to be honest with you, it, it, um, personally, I just do not like taking impressions under those conditions. For me, in my practice, the tissue has to be extremely healthy. If there's any bleeding uh, with me uh, or during the, the time that I'm managing the tissue, I do not uh, take my impression because I know I'm not going to be able to obtain a good impression. If I'm scanning, and I'll show you a couple of cases where I do scan, uh, if I'm scanning, again, if you have blood around the margins, you know, the difference between scanning and impressing or using digital versus analog is only a technique. It has nothing to do with the fundamentals of dentistry. In both cases, you have to have good tissue management. In both cases, you have to have very nice and clear margins. In both cases, either the camera or the impression material need to capture uh, your margins in order for you to be able to deliver an ideal restoration. So in this particular case, because the, the response was, you know, the, the, the tissue had healed, but it didn't heal completely. So we didn't have a favorable response. This patient was referred to the periodontist. And what we did is what, uh, what we did for this particular patient, because there was no violation of the biological width, we did a biological reshaping. In other words, with a flap, what I, once the periodontist raised the flap, he went ahead and he eliminated all the margin. He did a kind of like a vertical preparation, uh, made sure that the tissue contours, were, uh, the bone contours were ideal, that there was enough space for biological width, a new biological width formation. And then he went ahead and, and, and suture. So there was really no bone removal. It was just biological reshaping, eliminating of the previous margin so that the tissue can heal around that area. And then I can go ahead and place a new margin in my second preparation. So what you're seeing here between the photo on the left and the photo on the right is six months after that procedure when the patient came back to me in order for me to now place a new margin and restore this tooth with a new restoration. So I want you to look at the tissue. You can see that there's a 100% difference. You can see how nice uh, uh, fibrous tissue attached gingival around the margin. Uh, you can actually see where the new margin of the temporary is located. So uh, again, this is about me making sure that during my impression technique, I'm able to control the tissue uh, well. I'm able to retract the tissue without any bleeding so that I can have a very nice clean area either to impress or to scan. So what is now my tip and trick number two? So my tip and trick number two is the question about digital or analog. And again, you know, for me, both of these, I mean, I've been doing um, regular PBS impressions for the great majority of my career. I've been a dentist for 25 years, and I think I've been doing digital impressions for the last two to three years. So I've been doing analog impressions for 22 years of my career, and I still do uh, uh, analog uh, impressions on, on some of my cases. Now, I want to share with you this case because 
again, this is not only about having the technology. We have to look into our practice. We have to look into our, the reality of practice and the reality of our, of our patients. And, you know, how many of these patients, uh, you know, are able to always get a cl clinical crown lengthening or how are we always able to manage these tissues in, the, in a good way in order for us to either by digital or, ana or analog means get a good impression. But in this particular case, even though uh, I wanted to go digital, I'm gonna show you why I ended up going analog. And the reason why I'm sharing this with you is that you have to have the skills to, to, to deal with both. So you're, you're gonna have your, your if, if you are in a, in a digital world and you're doing you know, the great majority of your, of your impressions or any other procedures uh, by using digital uh, um, uh, technology, that's great. But that doesn't mean that every single case that you have is going to be able to go that route. So you always want to make sure that you keep up to date and you keep your hands uh, and your techniques at, the, at a very high level just in case you ever would need to go back to analog impressions. And exactly this is, this is one, one case where I can show you that you can, you know, you, you view the PFM crown that the patient had. He had a lot of aesthetic concerns with that crown. It was, you know, the only indirect restoration that he presented with in the, in, in the aesthetic zone and he was just unhappy with it. Uh, he was unhappy with the diastema between eight and nine as well that was present when he came to me and he was unhappy with the over contour of the crown. You can see in the previous photo that the crown was, uh, uh, was bulky compared to his natural uh, um, neighboring teeth. So uh, on this photo, you see on the left-hand side, you see uh, I've, been, uh, I've removed the PFM crown, and now you understand why there was a, a, a over contour of the crown. You can see that there's under preparation uh, for the type of material they selected, uh, you know, of metal and opaque and porcelain to be added to that restoration. You need more space. If you compare it to the other type of restorations that we're doing today that have no metal background or either you know pressed or or milled type of restorations so that's something to consider so at this point uh you know he thick biotype look how healthy the tissue is but look at the yellow arrow and look at the yellow arrow on the distal margin of tooth number nine and you can see how deep that margin was uh so you can see the overgrowth of tissue the good thing is that there was still uh you know good biological width in that area so there was no inflammation. You can see that the tissue is nice and thick, but it was a deep tissue. And I want you to think, uh, I want you to look at this photo because when you look at the photo on the right-hand side, I have now gone in and, you know, remove all the old cement, just kind of remarginate the tooth, get a nice uh, smooth margin, 360 degrees around uh, the prepared tooth. But you know what? That distal margin was, was at that depth to begin with. So, uh, at this point, uh, you know, I'm, I, I try to eliminate any irregularities. There was, again, there was good biological width. There was no inflammation or bleeding of the tissue. So I was like, okay, I'm, you know, this is a tissue I can manage. I know I can place a cord. And I know that if, if I get to place a cord there and I get to separate the tissue, uh, you know, correctly, I'm going to be able to scan this without any problems. And uh, so, you know, I go ahead and I put a temporary on. I left the patient with the temporary for a couple of weeks. You can see that when he came back, maybe two to three weeks later, you can see that the tissue around that distal margin was, you know, had, had you know, um, I would say, I'm not going to say receded, but it wasn't as thick as it was at the beginning. You can see that the margin is still slightly deeper than the mesial margin, but you can see the, the distal tissue is a little bit thicker. It's a little bit less thicker than it was at the beginning. No inflammation again, no bleeding. And at this point, what I'm doing is I'm closing the diastema. So I'm adding some composite on the mesial of number nine, uh, I'm sorry, on the mesial of number eight and on the mesial of number 10. So with those two composites that I added there, and I'm just, you know, I haven't polished them yet. I've just added the composite. Uh, what, I, what I'm doing is trying to get the mesial distal width corrected on that, on that tooth number nine so that I can get both eight and nine to be, uh, to be you know, alike, identical, one to the other. And you can see here now I have my temporary, I have managed that diastema that the patient didn't like. I had to add a little bit of composite on the mesial of number 10 as well to get the right mesial distal width and to kind of duplicate what the patient had on tooth number eight. And again, I want you to look at the tissue because we're talking about impressions. We're not talking about, uh, uh, you know, uh, fixed prosthodontics, but we're talking about the impression aspect of fixed, prost fixed prosthodontics. So I want you to look at the tissue and I want you to look at how healthy it is, how thick the biotype is. So I know that... Um, 
you know, three months later, everything is where I want it to be. You can see now the composites have bio-integrated. Uh, you, you can barely tell that I have a composite on number eight and, and number 10, and I have the right initial distal width. So now I'm ready to go ahead, remove my temporary and retract the tissue. And I want you to see this. I have a very nice retraction, but I want you to look at the distal margin. And I want you to look at the difference between the distal margin and the mesial margin, because this is what's really going to make my point today. When you're looking at this, so I started out with a double, a double cord or two cord technique, and I've now removed the second cord and I'm leaving the first cord inside. And the objective of, of doing this and you know, leaving that first cord would obviously should be always underneath or below the actual uh, margin that you have prepared is to keep the tissue away by separating the tissue, by creating a true space between the gingival margin and the actual margin of my preparation. Now the scan is going to be able to read the tissue and the tooth and create that separation line so that it's easier for me to create the dye on my computer while I'm, uh, uh, you know, selecting exactly or defining where my margin is on the scan. But if you look at the distal aspect of, uh, of, of the of tooth number, of the tooth that we're working on, and you can see how the tissue, I was not able to remove the tissue in this area. Don't forget the tissue is a little bit thicker. So even though the tissue is nice and strong, it's nice and healthy and it's not bleeding, it's a thick tissue and it's kind of hiding my margin. So because of that, when I try to scan, and you can see that I have a very nice and well-defined tissue, but on the distal aspect, you see that thickness of the papilla is covering my margin, which we all know it was deep to begin with. It was slightly subgingival, but the thickness of that tissue is not allowing my eyes to view the margin. And if your eyes cannot view the margin from this, from this uh, perspective, well, guess what? Most likely, your scanner will not be able to do it either. So when I was trying to scan, my scan would not be able, was not able to capture or to separate nicely the tooth margin from the gingival margin. There was not enough space for the camera to capture that difference. And it was really hard for me to kind of detect and outline exactly where my margin was uh, in, my, in the screen of my computer. So what I, uh, so what I did is just in case, if I, you know, I, I left the scan, I, I knew that I didn't have an ideal scan, but I said, you know what, I have a scan, I have the best I can, I'm just gonna go ahead and use what I have and go from there. But just in case, I'm gonna go ahead and take an analog impression. And I want you to see this because at the end of the day, this is, this is what I use for the restoration. I did not end up using the scan because again, I was not able to capture or I was not happy with my capture, my capturing of that distal portion because of the thickness of the tissue. And I know many of you out there that are actually using scans, you are confronted with things like this as well when we have cases that our margin location is not ideal, but the tissue is healthy, the biological width is, is in the right place. So there's no need for me to go ahead and, and, and do any type of uh, surgical removal of any tissue. But I want you to look at the impression because even though the tissue was thick, I was able with a impression material, with the heavy material, push that tissue away and capture the 360 degrees of my margin. And not only capture the the, the margin that was prepared or the, or the margin where the burr was actually smoothing the, uh, my chamfer margin. But most importantly, I was able to capture that, that little ring around the margin that, it, that, be, that is really representing the portion of the tooth that was not prepped so that the lab can actually go ahead and cut their dyes uh, with the correct location of our margins and get a really good restoration back to us. So again, this is what I want you to see in this case. I was able to get my restoration and, and bond a final restoration on tooth number nine, a single crown for that tooth. But, and this photo was taken, you know, uh, I would probably 30 to 60 days after the restoration was delivered. But I want you to look at how nice and healthy the tissue continues to be. And the reason for that is because we were able to capture the, uh, the margins. We were able to, you know, get a good impression. I was not able in my hands, I was not able with the scanner that I was using at that time, I was not able to capture a good scan of that di uh, distal margin. Maybe there's other dentists out there that are able to do it better than I could, have more skills of scanning, have more experience on scanning, and that's okay and that's understandable. That could have been the, my issue, but at the same time, the, my, the goal here is to understand that both techniques are valid techniques and that we have to learn how to use, you know, we have to be good at both so that we can, uh, we can, you know, really select when we have cases that may not be ideal for this type of technology, how can we handle these cases? So let's go now to our tip and trick number three. 
And our tip and trick number three is, well, what happens when you have more complex cases where you have, you know, cases with excessive wear uh, and you can see these, you know, these patients, this, this particular patient has been in this, in this situation for many, many years. You can see some caries around the gingival margins. You can see some uh, um, discrepancies in the gingival zenith of many of these teeth, diastema, poor location, wear. I mean, there's so many things going on here. And when you think about it, if I were to prep this case uh, uh, without, you know, looking at the whole picture, you know, increasing vertical dimension, you know, new position for the incisal edge, you know, closing the diastemas, but most importantly, making sure that I have good finish line in every single tooth, you know, good finish lines so that I am able then towards the end to make a good, to obtain a good impression or a full mouth scan of this case. In, in, in my hands, I'm doing, when I do digital scanning, I'm doing more for partial type of dentistry. I'm not into the world of scanning full mouth cases yet. Uh, I'm doing more partial dentistry with, with, with scanning, scan technology, but these cases are still managed with regular PVS impression. And, and again, if you think about it, in my mind, when I, when I look at cases like this, I'm already thinking, okay, what do I need to do to get to the point that the day that I have to make my final impression, I, I, I can manage the tissue beautifully so that I can impress every single tooth at the same time because I don't want to divide this mouth in different uh, uh, impression sections. I want to do a full mouth impression and I want to be able to manage the tissue well. I want to be able to control and I don't want any bleeding. I want to make sure that I use the proper materials, the proper uh, uh, technique. And for that to happen, I have to have ideal biology before I get to the point of uh, impression. And that's what we have to understand. So for cases like this, and I'm not going to go into the waxing and into the uh, increase of vertical dimension, this is not the topic that we're reviewing today, but I just want you to tell you that when I have cases like this and I do my prototypes, and that's what you're seeing right here, I send my patient to the periodontist. Now the periodontist you know, knows exactly, okay, on tooth number nine, 10, 11, and tooth number six and seven, he knows where, my, where the margin of my final crown, so these teeth haven't been prepped yet, they've only been prototyped, but where the margins of my final restorations are going to be. And then he says, okay, where does the margin for the final preparation of tooth number eight needs to be in order for me to give uh, Mario, you know, nice and, and, and even uh, um, gingival scene so that I can have nice pink aesthetics. And, and you're, that's, what he, that's what he's doing here. He's, he's saying, okay, this is where the margin is going to be. I need to get I need to create a new space for biological width. So I'm going to go ahead and reshape, make sure that I get the right contours. And this is all about the periodontist. This is nothing about me. But what I do for my periodontist is I tell him and I give him a good template so that he can go ahead and, and do what he needs to do to give me what I need. And what I'm looking for is ideal biology. I'm looking for ideal biology. I'm looking for ideal response of this tissue to the surgery. I'm looking for thick uh, uh, attached gingiva, uh, so that I can go ahead, make sure that everything heals well. I want to wait the right time. And when I do cases like this with my periodontist, we wait, I like waiting at least six months. Now, many people would say, or maybe many people would disagree with me and they would say, no, but I wait, you know, three months and I know that three months is okay. And that's, you know, numbers are numbers. So that I'm not here to change anybody's philosophy. I'm just telling you the way that I do it. I think that the more you wait, the more stable these margins are going to turn out to be. But what I want you to see in this photo, this is six months after the surgery was done. So that's the time, the amount of time that we waited for healing. And what I want you to see now is I'm prepping the teeth. I'm just prepping the teeth. So he did the surgery. Everything went by prototypes. The teeth were not prepped. Now, six months later, I'm getting ready to prep. And where do I put my finish line? I want you to see my finish line and I want you to see the gingival margins. And my finish line, my, the margins of my preparations are right at the gingival margin. So I don't want to take these margins deep. I'm not the kind of person that likes deep margins. I think that today with the, with the biomaterials that we have today, uh, you know, Emacs and Zirconia and all these new all ceramic type of uh, restorative materials, there's really nothing that we need to hide. So there is no reason why I need to go subgingival. It just makes it more difficult for me. It makes my, my retraction uh, uh, time longer. It makes, you know, all the tissue management and it makes it more risky because again, in my clinical setting, if there's any bleeding, I don't like to take impressions. So I want to have full control 
of my tissues. And that's what I'm doing here. I'm going to go ahead. I'm going to prep half of the mouth. I create my, uh, my inner occlusal jigs so that I can maintain vertical dimension. And then I go ahead and prep the other side. And again, I want you to look at the other preparations. Look at the gingival margins. You can see that I'm right at the, uh, my, my, my finish line is right at the gingival margin. I'm not going deep. I'm not in approximately. I'm staying right at the gingival margin as well. Because again, I don't, I don't, I'm going to choose materials that don't have any under, uh, underlying gray or metal structure. So I'm going to, you know, I know that I'm going to be able to, to bio-integrate all this just by selecting good materials. So again, I prep the entire mouth. I put all my temporaries. Personally, I don't take final impressions the day that I complete my preparations. I always wait for that as well because when you're prepping, sometimes, you know, you're prepping many teeth, you can go ahead and lacerate a little bit of the tissue here and there, and you're going to get a little bit of bleeding. So I just temporize, send my patient home. I normally take my impressions two weeks after I prepare, and during those two weeks, I give my I, I give my patients a prescription with chlorhexidine, and I just have them rinse once or twice a day for those 15 days, so that when they get to me, tissue is very nice and healthy. I help them and I and I teach them how to maintain the temporaries clean and how to use interproximal toothbrushes so that I want to make sure that they understand the importance of the next step. And I want to make sure that they understand that I don't want to repeat my impression. I want to take one impression and for that to happen and not be and not have you know not have to redo any impression, I got to manage the tissue correctly from the first from from the get-go. So what I normally do in cases like this when I have periodontal surgery you know, my periodontist, he has great hands and he always gave me these very nice thick uh, biotype tissues kind of in, in return. So I go ahead and I normally have room for two cords. And when I say two cords, I use two double zero cords. So I use, I use thin cords. I don't use thick cords. I use two, uh, two double zero cords per tooth. And I just leave the second cord inside. Both cords are there for at least six to 10 minutes. Then I remove the second cord. And when I remove the second cord, I leave the first cord in place. I got to make sure that that first cord is underneath, completely underneath uh, the margins of my preparation. I don't want that cord touching whatsoever or being not even close to the level of, the, of, the, um, of my margin. Because again, what I want to try to get on my impression, and if you look at my impression on the right-hand side, what I'm trying to achieve is that very nice ring around my margins. And that ring represents the portion of the tooth that was not uh, 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 touched by the burr. And the reason why I want that there is because when this impression goes to the lab and the lab technician pours this, this impression, pours the master cast, he's going to be able to see that where the tissue is and where my margins start. He's going to be able to see because that, that, that ring is going to be on the cast. It's going to be literally a separation between the tissue and my, the, the margin of my preparation. And I want them to see that so that when he goes back and, and, and trims the dyes, he, I am sure that he knows exactly where my finish line is located. And that's, we all know that that's very, very important. So you want to see that on your entire impression. This is the same patient, mandibular arch. You can see the implants. You can see every single preparation. And now I've removed the second cord. And I want you to see how nice and, 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 and even no bleeding. Look at how nice and pink the tissue is. And look at my impression on the right-hand side. You can see again the rings around all my margins, just to you know, just to go back and and and, and make sure that you understand the importance of that in your impression, so that when the lab uh, pours this for you, they have that finish line right where they need to have it, and they're able to um, to trim your dyes according, you know, to trim your dyes in a in a in a good way. So now let's go to tip and trick number four, and tip and trick number four is okay. So what happens in cases where I have deep margins? I have tissue covering these margins, but for medical reasons or financial reasons, I'm not able to, you know, the patient is not able to get a clinical chronic procedure and I still have to restore the tooth. So this is this example right here. And, you know, this patient came to me, you can see that, um, that the tooth had a root canal performed, the endodontist had re reduced both buccal and lingual cusp. Uh, the patient had, you know, she was, she was in a lot of pain when, before getting the root canal. And, you know, the root canal was done. The endodontist referred the patient to me uh, for me to, you know, go ahead and restore the tooth. So rule number one for this technique, and what this is called is margin elevation technique. And I know that many of you have heard this before. I don't know if clinically you've been, uh, you've been uh, able to perform this. Uh, 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 this is a, you know, it's a very common procedure, uh, and it's one option. 
It's another option if you don't have, you know, ideally I would have wanted this to, to, you know, go ahead and get a clinical crown lengthening and just, you know, get the margin completely super gingival. It was going to be a lot easier for me to manage. But in this particular case, for medical and financial reasons, this patient could not be uh, seen by the periodontist. So I had to deal with it. So my number one rule for margin elevation is I need to be able to obtain ideal isolation. If I am not able to obtain ideal isolation, I am not going to go ahead and do any margin elevation, and I am not going to use that material that I used to elevate that margin as, my, as the new margin or finish line for my indirect restoration. So I'm not going to put that at risk. I want to make sure that I can achieve good isolation. And you see here in this photo that I was able, even though I want you to look how wrinkled uh, uh, the rubber dam on that distal area appears to be right where those arrows are. And it's wrinkled because all that is tissue. So the tissue was at least, I would say, one millimeter above the gingival margin of the preparation. So there was a lot of tissue surrounding that area. And that tissue, it was going to be very difficult for me to be able to push it away with any cord and avoid bleeding and, and all the other bad things that can happen. So I needed to make sure that I was going to be able to isolate this. And, you know, when you isolate, uh, and I don't know if you're able to see on the photo, but on the buckle aspect of, of, of the tooth uh, towards the bottom of your, of your screen, you will see that on the right-hand side of the tooth that I'm working on, uh, there's a little bit of a, you can see a little knot. That's a floss, a piece of floss. Because what I did here is I, I used a floss ligature technique in order for me to wrap the rubber dam and make sure that the rubber dam was very, very nice and tight, completely subgingival. So this floss ligature technique is the one that allows me, or allows not me, but the rubber dam, allows the rubber dam to be submerged underneath the gingival margin so that now you have full visualization of the margin. If you cannot see the margin, and if this margin is not kept clean, no bleeding, no curricular fluid, there is no way that you're going to be able to obtain or, 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 or do a margin elevation technique that is predictable. So the number one thing that you need is to be predictable. And for that to happen, you have to have access to a very nice and clean margin. So now that you can see that there's no bleeding, there's no, there's no moisture, everything is under control, I'm going to go ahead and I'm going to place a Toffelmeyer band. And this Toffelmeyer band is going to go subgingival as well. I'm going to go ahead and just build, and I'm using a bulk fill type of composite just to build that margin a couple of millimeters, maybe two millimeters, 1.5 to two millimeters, so that I can bring the margin, my, my restorative margin, super gingival. That's the ultimate goal. So what I'm doing here is I'm bringing that margin up using composites where I have to acid edge, prime and bond, and this is now me after removal of the Toffelmeyer band, now you can see that I was able to bring that margin all the way up. So now the margin is beyond the rubber dam. So now my margin, my restorative margin is super gingival. At this point, I'm not going to scan yet because this, this case, I'm, I, I'll show you. I, and and this, these are the cases that I scanned day in and day out today. But what I want to show you here is that I'm elevating this margin. I know that, there, that I have good control. I'm going to put a temporary and I'm going to wait 15 days or 21 days you know, two to three weeks, two to three weeks later, what am I going to do? The number one thing that I want to do is I want to go in with my probe and you can see that I'm probing the area and there's no bleeding upon probing. We had bleeding upon probing initially because the margin was way down and, they were, and it was rough. At this point, this margin is nice and smooth. I'm probing. There is no bleeding upon probing. I have a, an x-ray to make sure that my composite is completely bonded and, it, and there is no gap. There is no space this is now going to be my new prosthetic margin. So my prosthetic margin for that distal aspect of this tooth is going to be that bulk fill composite that I added there. And this is the scan. Because if you think about it now, I'm able to scan because my margin is completely super gingival. I didn't, if you, if you look at the, at the scan, there is no cord because there was no need for a cord. My margin was completely super gingival. It was at least half of a millimeter to one millimeter super gingival. So I had full, the, the, the scan, the camera had full access to the margin and everything else was super gingival. So I did an, an, an onlay type of restoration here. And you can see the design of the crown, the design of the intaglio surface. So that now you're seeing, okay, this is, this is following 
uh, 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 the continuity of my preparation. And this is my final restoration. And I have a buckle view and I have a lingual view. And this is, a, this is the day of delivery. Because you can see the tissue is a little bit inflammated because of the clamps of the rubber dam. But I want you to look at the lingual aspect. And you can see on the lingual area towards the gingival aspect, you can see the composite. You can see the bulk fill that is elevating the margin. And kind of, you know, half of a millimeter above the gingival margin, you now see my restoration, my indirect restoration that was bonded to all that enamel that was available. But on the distal aspect, I have a margin elevated it, elevation uh, technique that I performed there in order for me to have a new position of that prosthetic margin. And now that prosthetic margin is made out of composite. And again, this is something, uh, you know, cases like this I do every day. I like to do a lot of partial coverage. There is no need in my practice today for full coverage crowns. I mean, I only if I have to remove a crown, I go ahead and, and do a new crown. But if I have the option to restore that tooth from the get-go, and it's just, you know, and, 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 and I have a lot of healthy tooth structure on it, I'm not going to prep a crown. I'm, I do these onlays day in and day out. Today, they have millions of names, overlays, onlays, endo crowns. They got so many different names. It's kind of difficult to keep up with all these names. But at the end of the day, what I'm trying to do is a full coverage occlusal restoration that is going to be bonded to all that enamel, all that available enamel that we still have, and that is healthy enamel from the patient. But again, because you saw the previous uh, uh, photo, you saw that the margins were all super gingival, very easy for the scanner to capture all the details of my preparation. You can see the occlusal scan, you can see the, the, the buckle scan for the bite rate registration. And then, you know, what I do is I scan and I, I don't mill myself. I just send these images to the lab. The lab goes ahead and he mills the restoration for me and he sends it back. And this is the day of delivery right after removal of the rubber dam. You can see the tissue is a little bit irritated because of the clamp. When I have cases like this, I'm going to use a W8A uh, clamp, which is a very active and aggressive clamp. So you see a little bit of tissue irritation, but I need to have good isolation in order for me to have ideal bonding of the areas. But this is the final restoration. And again, we're not talking about restorations. We're talking about how do I manage the tissues? Where do I locate my margins? How do I choose you know, digital or analog? Do I have to still use both of them? And how to go about these in order for me to get good impressions or digital scans and, and be able to deliver high quality restorations. So now let's go to my tip and trick number five. So my tip and trick number five is one that I've been doing, uh, I've been using for many years and there's a lot of evidence to support this. And this is about polishing my preparations. So what I'm showing you here is I'm showing you two crown preparations on eight and nine. And, and yeah, you know, one tooth is prepped a little bit more. The other one is a little bit less because one tooth, you can see it's a lot darker and I wanted to make sure that I was gonna be able to hide that with my final all ceramic restoration. But again, this is all about prep, uh, impressions. So this is the day of my impression. And you can see that on the tooth that is darker because of the darkness and the color of the tooth, I did not want that to show through my restoration. You can see that the margin of tooth number eight is a little bit below the gingival margin. And when I say a little bit, maybe half of a millimeter. So I, I'm very, very uh, careful when I'm putting my margins slightly subgingival. I normally do this by placing a cord and then doing a, you know, I do my first preparation to the gingival margin. I place a cord, just one very thin cord, a double zero cord, and then I remarginate my preparation to the new uh, height of the gingival margin. And that's gonna take my, my final preparation to slightly below the gingival margin. And again, I want you to compare it to the preparation on tooth number nine. That preparation is at the gingival margin. So there's, there is no need for me to hide anything there because the, the color of that tooth is a natural uh, uh, color. So I know that I'm not going to get any, any kind of you know, discrepancy between my restoration and the actual margin. So if you look at these two preparations on the same patient, what is the other thing that you can capture from this, from this photo? I want you to look at how smooth my preparations are. So once I complete my preparations, I go ahead and, and you know, you use a coarse burr for that. I go ahead and I choose a fine diamond burr. So I go with a red stripe or a yellow stripe, or I sometimes I go the red stripe fir first and then followed by the yellow stripe diamond burr. I try, to, I, I, I always want to make sure that the width of all three burrs, the green stripe or the coarse, the coarse burr, the red and the yellow, they're both, they're all the same shape and same diameter, uh, same width in the tip. So the same shape of, of burr, um, so that I can keep my preparation the same. All I want to do is just smooth out the enamel and, and the dentin. So I smooth out my preparation using 
birds that have, you know, that are less aggressive and that have thinner diamonds so that they polish more. But then at the, I want, want to complete the preparation, I use an enhanced point. And with the enhanced point underwater, I go ahead and polish all my preparation. For the inner proximal areas, I use disc. I use, you know, either soft flex disc or any type of, of, of disc that you use in your practice. And I use the medium coarse and the medium fine on the inner proximal areas just to get everything nice and smooth. And the reason for me to do this is because I know that my impression material, if I'm going to use an analog impression, is going to be able to flow very nicely. It's going to be able to wet very nicely all this surface because there's no, there's no roughness in the surface. So it's going to wet beautifully the surface and it's going to be able to capture every single aspect or every single detail of my preparation. So I'm showing you here the same preparations, but slightly towards the side so that I want you to look at the inner proximal areas, how nicely polished they are. So again, I use an enhanced point on the buckle and lingual. I use a uh, soft flex disc, medium and, and, and fine on the inner proximal areas just to get everything nice and smooth. And I do all these, I, I do all these steps under water. So I, I always have the tooth wet while I'm polishing my preparation and look at the type of impression that I'm going to obtain. And again, I do this for all my preparations, for my onlays, for my crowns on molars, for my crowns on anterior teeth, for my veneer preparations. I smooth all my preparations before I get, e e even if I'm going to scan. If I'm going to scan or I'm going to impress, I'm so used to doing this step and my eyes are so used to looking at this very nice and smooth surface that I do it all the time, independent of if I'm going to scan or impress or, you know, use an analog impression. And the whole point is just to make sure that I get beautiful, nice and wet surfaces. This photo was taken probably 30 to 60 days after the restorations were delivered. I want to look at the gingival aspect, healthy tissues. Uh, and again, no flag effect. You don't see the transition between the crown and the actual tooth that was prepared. And my final tip, my tip number six um, is now, okay, so now we know that we have healthy tissues. Now we know where the margins need to be located. Now we know that if we don't have ideal locations of the margins, we have two options. We can either send the patient to the periodontist and he can do two types of procedures. He can go ahead and do a, a, a regular clinical crown lengthening with some bone reduction to give you a new biological width. Or if the bone is, is, is the, um, um, yeah, if the, if the bone is located at the right head, if the, if the crest of the bone is located at the right, in the right position and there's no need for removal of bone because they want to be conservative today. So what he's going to do is going to do a vertical preparation so that you can remarginate after healing of the tissue. So those are the two options on the periodontal side. On the restorative side, your option is the margin elevation technique. And you have to uh, understand and keep in mind that for you to do the margin elevation technique, to be able to do it correctly, you have to be able to isolate perfectly before going ahead and doing your margin elevation technique. So my final step now is, and then you have the polishing of the teeth. So my final step now is, okay, everything is done. My margins are correct. The tissue is now healthy. How am I going to get, how do I prepare the tissue in my hands, either to scan or to impress? In this particular case, I'm going to use an impression technique. And I, you see, I'm, I'm, I've placed two cords. So what you're seeing on the right-hand side photo is my second cord. The second cord, I really don't, I don't push it in. Uh, 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 the first one, I want to make sure that it's completely subgingival. It's completely below my, the margins of my preparation. The second cord, I only apply it very softly on top. I just keep it slightly below the gingival margin. And the whole idea of this second cord, I keep it there for six to 10 minutes. And the whole idea of this second cord is just to push the tissue away, just to you know make sure that the tissue is out of the way and I get a beautiful separation between the actual tissue margin and the margin of my preparation. So I wait six to 10 minutes, six to 10 minutes later, I'm removing the cord. And uh, uh, I just want you to know that I, I use hemostatic agent on my first cord. I don't use hemostatic agent on the second cord because the first cord is already wet. As you can see, whatever's left on the first cord is going to be now absorbed by the second cord. And then I'll, before I remove the cord, because I have waited six to 10 minutes, it's important to tell you, I normally rinse my cords with water. And the reason for that is because this cord is gonna dry in there, it's gonna get dry inside that, that, that sulcus. And if you peel it off without getting it wet, you're gonna remove some of the cells that have now attached to this cord and you might get some bleeding. 
So in order for you to control that, I always rinse, wet the area, make sure that the cord is soaked in water, and then very, very gently with the cotton pliers, I'm gonna start removing the cord very, very gently and slowly. Again, I don't want any bleeding at this point. And you can see that I'm going very slowly. I was able to take a photo of every single aspect of the removal. You can see that there is no bleeding of the tissue. And the other aspects that you can see a true separation from the tissue to the margin of my preparation. There is a space. That space is now gonna be occupied by my impression material. And if you're gonna scan, that space is gonna allow your scanner to copy every single aspect and, and copy exactly where your finish line is and create that separation on the digital world so that now when you go back in and trim your dye in the digital world, you know exactly where your margin was located and you have a really good, well-adapted restoration. If you're gonna get an analog impression, you have removed that cord. I go ahead and rinse one more time, dry. I gotta make sure that there is no bleeding. Sometimes you do get a little bit of bleeding. I rinse and I wait. I give it two to three minutes so that I wait. I make sure that there is no more bleeding. I rinse one more time, check and make sure that everything is okay. Go ahead and dry. And then I start injecting the material. I want to show you here that the, where the tip of that syringe is located. I have taken the tip of the syringe for the light material all the way down to the sulcus. And I'm pushing the material within the sulcus, within that space. And if you look at the, right, uh, the left uh, hand side photo, you can see that I'm actually placing the material within the, st the space that was left behind by the removal of the second cord. And then I make sure that I, 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 I flow enough material on the buccal aspect. I go ahead then and I start going towards the lingual aspect following exactly the same technique. You can see the tip is all the way down into that space. I'm squirting the material within that space. Now I get my first uh, layer of impression material, light body impression material within the sulcus. What comes next? Now I'm gonna use a little bit of air. So I'm gonna grab my air water syringe. I'm not gonna do full blast, but I'm gonna go medium blast, very light uh, uh, air. And I'm gonna go ahead and push the impression material within the sulcus. So not only that I'm injecting the impression material right into the sulcus, I'm gonna use some air and just make sure that I break a little bit of the superficial energy within that impression material push it into the sulcus and make sure that I, I don't get any bubbles around that area. Once I do that on the buckle, on the lingual and inner proximally, I'm gonna go ahead again. You're gonna see on the right-hand side of the photo and I'm adding even more light material on top of that. And then while I'm doing that, my dental assistant is delivering the heavy material on the tray. Once that happens, I grab the tray, I seat it into the patient's mouth, wait for the time being three to four minutes or six minutes, depending on the material that you're using and the time that the, the material actually requires for you to have it in there. And then I go ahead and remove my impression material and look at the impression. Now, this case is a nice case because I have, you know, one of my residents is, uh, he loves the digital world and he was scanning this patient because we were gonna do this. Uh, this is one of my patients, but he was scanning the patient and, uh, and, and this same patient, this same preparation, he scanned it first and then I took an impression, uh, 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 a regular impression. And for whatever reason, we were not able in the scan to copy. And again, he is, he's been scanning for years since he was in dental school. So he's been doing this for three years. He's very, very well versed with this in the scanning and digital world. But again, you know, it, this is it, technique sensitive as well. You have to learn how to do it right. You have to make sure that you understand and you interpret correctly what you see on the computer. Uh, but in this particular case, I was more confident with the impression that I obtained, uh, analog impression. And this is what we use for the final restoration. But what I want you to see is I want you to see the margins. I want you to see that ring around the margin. Again, just to make sure that we understand that that represents the portion of the tooth that was not prepped. And that's what gives the lab the ability to go ahead and trim your dye very, very well. So